120 world leaders have gathered for the United Nations Secretary General's Climate Summit in New York. I knew this was coming up, so I thought we would invite Lord Monckton onto the program to talk about the issue of climate change. He is an outstanding academic and has been a long-time opponent, arguing with rationality that climate change is a hoax, to put it simply. However, when we decided to put the program together for tonight, I thought it best, or we thought it best, I talked about this to Graham, that we have someone from the other side. Uh, for the last seven days, we've been seeking to get someone from the other side to debate against Lord Monckton tonight. No one could materialise. Professor David Corolli, who is Australia's most outspoken supporter of the notion of a carbon dioxide tax and the impact that carbon dioxide is having on global warming, said he wasn't available. He then said, as late as today, that no one was able or willing, with such short notice of one day, to be able to come on the program to discuss the topic. I would have thought if you were confident of the ground you're standing on, you would be both able and willing to do something at five minutes notice. But Lord Monckton is with me anyway. Welcome to the program. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. So this conference to today, which starts 120 world leaders, including Barack Obama and David Cameron, Tony Abbott, not there. But if we could just go back to the simple truths of this business about global warming caused by carbon dioxide. We've had this myth in Australia about a carbon tax. It wasn't a carbon tax, it was a carbon dioxide tax. 97%, are we right in saying to agree on a couple of things? 97% of the carbon dioxide produced in the world is not man-made. That's Naturally right. Naturally produced. That's right. Yeah. If you take the whole carbon cycle, that is right. We have added something like 100 parts per million to the atmosphere since 1750. It's really not a vast problem. So 3% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is created by human beings. That's industry and that sort of thing. 3%. Got to be slightly careful of the way one phrases yes. that, because you could make out that, that we have added 40% to what was there in 1750. It depends on how you cast up the numbers. The 3% is if you take into account all the exchanges in the carbon cycle. So, and then of that 3% worldwide, mm. what about little tiny Australia? What's it contributing where we're trying to... Well, you, you, you contribute one and a half percent of that tiny fraction. So if Australia were to disappear off the map, it would not make any difference to global temperature. You wouldn't be able to measure it. Yet you've got someone like the climate change guru here, who was an Australian of the year, Tim Flannery, said a couple of years ago, and I quote, if the world as a whole cut all emissions tomorrow, the average temperature of the planet is not going to drop for several hundred years, possibly a thousand years. What are we doing in New York? We are essentially trying to usher in a regime, putting it bluntly, of global communism, global fascism, global centralization, global totalitarianism. You saw Ban Ki-moon for the first time utterly, abjectly abandoning the impartiality that his office as Secretary General of the UN enjoins upon him, marching on the streets with communists and fellow travellers, waving their red flags, saying capitalism is the problem, climate change is the symptom, and socialism, by which they mean communism, is the solution, and Ban Ki-moon is with them, cheering them on and marching with them all the way. He should now resign, and the UN, frankly, serves no useful purpose if it is going to do what he has made it do, take a side in politics in favour of those who would destroy the West. Now, destroy the West, of course, by removing the cheapest form of energy there is, namely coal-fired energy, and of course that has a tremendous impact on us here, and that would destroy the source of our wealth. Terry McCran said to me in an interview I did with him some years ago, to decarbonise the economy is to write a national suicide note. This has been going on, though, hasn't it, for 20 years, We've had these people from 200 states meeting for two weeks every December That's to, tr right. to try and persuade the world that there's some apocalyptic consequence of us not doing something about carbon dioxide. That's right. And may I now show you the, the graph which is the best kept secret in the whole of the climate change argument. You will not see this on any other channel. The ABC won't show it, Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10. None of them will show this graph. Can we have that graph up now, please? What that graph shows, you'll see it now, is that there has been no global warming 
at all for 17 years and 11 months. And this is the official record from the satellites of Remote Sensing Systems Incorporated, one of the five big global data sets. And the trend has been calculated there. It shows no global warming at all for practically all the 20 years that this conference has been taking place annually in some exotic location where all the delegates like to go. And yet, for the last 30 years, the United States have spent $80 billion trying to come to the conclusion that we've got something to fear with carbon dioxide. $80 billion. And isn't it true that at the Cancun conference, they agreed, these delegates, that they would appropriate $100 billion a year to this issue? In fact, it's now estimated that something like $1 billion a day, or well over $300 billion a year, is being spent one way or another worldwide, trying to make global warming go away when it hasn't been happening for most of the last two decades. So how, why is it, therefore, that the argument on the other side seems to have currency with government, with the media, with the bureaucracy? Are they too gutless to face up to the fact that they were wrong, or is there another agenda here somewhere? By the speed with which all their forecasts have gone wrong. The rate of warming in the 25 years since the UN's climate panel made its first report is half what was then with substantial confidence predicted. They were simply wrong and they don't want to admit it. So they will not show these figures. They will not go back and check their previous ludicrous exaggerations. And yes, there is another agenda too. There is no doubt, if you look at the composition of that march in New York and the various other marches around the world. They were overwhelmingly hard left groups that were in this. Totalitarianism, which is this desire, this control freakery, the desire to run every aspect of our lives down to the last poison-filled flickering mercury light bulb. They now tell us what kind of light bulbs we can and can't have. This is mesmerically attractive to the left. They want to impose this worldwide. They want to impose a world government. Now you may think, Moncton is being very extreme here. I'm merely quoting from the Copenhagen Treaty Draft of uh, 2009. Well, the Draft of Cancun made the same point, didn't it? Cancun about... established a, a thousand new bureaucracies. New bureaucracies, world secretary. Yes. That's right. To the people watching you out there, though, the consequences of this are very, very severe, are they not? I mean, we, you can't... Now we're saying, oh, well, we must be renewable energy target uh, targets that have been set because we can't have coal-fired power, which has been the source of our economic strength for a long, long time. Now, if you then shove in renewable energy targets, you're talking about wind and solar, which are four, five, six, seven times dearer than coal-fired power. So on the one hand, manufacturing then goes somewhere else yeah. where it's cheaper. On the other hand, it closes down and jobs are lost here. And people watching you now find their energy bill climbing and climbing and climbing. They can't even turn on the blanket. Now, you wonder how Australia could be so silly to be sucked into this strategy whereby our economic wealth is being jeopardised. You only have to look at who's doing it. It's the hard left. Again, it's the Gillards of this world. It's the Turnbulls of this world. The people who ought to know better. The people who have decided that they want to wreck capitalism. They want to gain some personal advantage, in Turnbull's case. And I think there's going to be a very determined attempt to remove Tony Abbott, whom I regard as one of the best prime ministers the world has got at the moment, over the next year, because they want to get 100% of the nations at the Paris Treaty, which is where this, this next attempt to impose world government is going to come. Next year, they will want Abbott gone by then, because well, they don't want him pooping on the party. Just coming back to Paris, because that's a yeah. key point. Paris is 2015. Yeah. So the whole, all these strategies, these meetings, every year have been leading to Paris. They hope at Paris... They'll have been propagandised sufficiently to convince all these 200 nation states to sign a quote-unquote treaty. Not that they can call it a treaty because it would have to be ratified by the Senate of the United States of America. And, that's right. And, and they, they won't. They won't. But nonetheless, that's what it's leading up to, isn't it? Next year, 2015, which is the key year. This is the end game now. Yeah. In the next year, you will see, as you will have heard on the ABC all this week, uh, relentless propaganda being pushed out, left-wing propaganda, hard left, 
totalitarian propaganda. They want this world government. They, they've seen how well it worked in the European Union, which is essentially a totalitarian dictatorship now. No jackboots yet, but no doubt they're working on it. But the point is they're now trying to make that go worldwide. They want to centralise all government in the hands of the UN and make sure that democracy disappears, capitalism disappears. They don't want capitalism, these people. The ABC doesn't want capitalism. It lives by it, but it doesn't want it. This is what they're trying to do. And they very nearly succeeded at Copenhagen. Fortunately, it was publicised in advance. But now they've driven the treaty making process underground. Here's an experiment you can do at home if you're watching this. Go to your computer when you after the programme and click on the, first of all, the Doha Climate Summit of 2012 and then on the Warsaw Climate Summit of 2013. You need unfccc.int to find those. And then in each of those two annual climate conferences in this series of 20 that have been going on, click on the link marked decisions and you will find you will not be told what the decisions are. It's a self-referent link. It brings you back to the same page you started at mm. on both of those conferences. Mm. Because when I went to the Doha conference, I said, please, can I have, as I have for the last five years, a copy of the draft conclusions of the chair, which were the decisions they were taking. They said they'd never heard of any such thing. They've driven it underground. They're going to do it in secret now and then foist it on us in 2015. But there is one thing that anyone watching can do to help to make sure this doesn't happen. Write to Tony Abbott and say that the one thing that he must do to make sure this treaty does not do any harm is to include, as was included in the Kyoto Protocol, an article that says that any nation bound by this treaty can give six months notice and get out of right. it. And that's what if you do, do that, that will draw its Absolutely. teeth and make it harmless. Well, we'll take a break. I'll, lest we think there's some alarmist talk in what uh, Professor Mumpton is saying. We'll take a break and I'll come back and after the break indicate to you the extent to which our own taxpayer funded Bureau of Meteorology has doctored and manipulated temperature figures. We'll take a break.